Hello and welcome. I'm Daniel Sackreiter. Alongside me is Chase Hobson. And we're here today to report on the Michigan Michigan State table gate going on in the Skyline Club here. We're going to be covering the festivities going on and have some interviews later, so be sure to stick around for that. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 13th annual Michigan Michigan State table gate media luncheon. Well, first of all, it's great to see everybody, you know, after a year off the pandemic and all that, it's great to see everybody back here again, full house, it's exciting. Now, before we got this going, you know, I was doing a little, little uh, review, it went on Google and it's looking at Michigan and Michigan State, and I know Mel Tucker says statistics are for losers, but in the last 20 years, Michigan has won 10 games. Michigan State has won 10 games. Michigan and Michigan State, the points they've scored in the last 20 years, Michigan State has averaged 23 points. Michigan has averaged 24 points. So we're coming into this weekend. Both teams are 7-0. and Both teams are in the top 10. And this is going to be the best Tablegate ever when Eli takes over and brings our special guests up here because they've got stories to tell. So in order to kick this whole thing off, we're going to go back and start eating, but here's Father Andrew Kowalczyk from St. Clair Monte Falco. He is a real sports guy, loves, uh, loves soccer, likes football, likes hockey, and he's going to give a special invocation. Thank you, everyone. Let us bow our heads and let us invoke God's presence in our midst. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to gather together to eat, talk, socialize, and prepare for the much-anticipated meeting between our state college football powerhouses. This year is even more exciting as the two undefeated teams from Michigan go head-to-head -head in this rival matchup. God, our Father, you have created us to strive for the best. We ask you that from that coin toss on the Saturday night until the final play, that you protect all players from injury, harm, as they battle for this special trophy, may they show respect for each other. Let the play be exciting, may the passes be complete, tackles made, and the kicks count. Let the refs raise both hands high many times, and may the only flag uh, flying high be not green, be not blue, but are red, white, and blue. And yes, Lord, we all know your favorite, the Hail Mary, pass as the time runs out. Most of all, may all athletes, coaches, and fans enjoy this time honor game. Help them all to extend the same effort they do in this game in their personal life being sound models to imitate for all who admire them. And finally, we pray for your grace, Lord, for food in the world where many are hungry, for faith in the world where many live in fear, for friends in the world when many walk alone. And we give you thanks, O Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Now, officially, to kick this off, we ask our, our Connor and uh, Tony and Jake and Jack to come on up here and, and Paulette Bunyan this year. I had a call from Paul this morning, and uh, he had a medical emergency, so Paulette has stepped in to do the official. So come on up, guys. You gotta, you gotta, we're going to really cut the cake now. So grab, grab your knives. There's a knife there for each of you. Now you can't cut into the other person's end zone. You have to cut into your own side of the cake. So Jen, now don't slam that down into the, you know, gently drop the ax. You, you can destroy the tape. No, we don't want to do that. So guys, okay, get the, get the knives over there. Get ready to slice your piece of cake. Get them in there. Jen, put that ax down into the cake. I am a member of the media. I am always impartial, so I'm going to cut it right down the middle. 
Very good, Jen. Okay. Oh, geez. <laughs> okay. That is. You can do that if you want to do it. <laughs> okay. So we're going to come out here. Where's our, where's our skyline? They're going to take the cake out. They're going to cut the cake. And we're going to start serving food. So starting at, uh, let's say, starting up here with our guest tables, go on back, get your food, and we'll get this show on the road. Okay, Michigan, Michigan State tables, go on back there and start up and then follow, follow front to back. Ready, Jen? Okay, let's get the uh, let's get our show on the road here, and let me introduce the president of Detroit Sports Media Association, Paulette Bunyan, also known as President Jennifer Hammond. Thank you, Bill Harrington, and we want to say a special thank you um, to first a couple of people who made this date possible. Bill Harrington being one of them. Bobby Keys, where are you? Recognize Bobby Keys for all his kick-ass work to get this thing up and going. I've got to say, when we were talking about Tablegate probably about four or five weeks ago, we are starting to think, okay, 2-0, and 3-0, oh, 4-0, and oh, and oh, got to 5-0, and 6-0, oh, and, oh, and then, of course, all we needed was for Michigan to handle Northwestern, which they did very well. So here we are, 7-0, and oh, which is super exciting. I know that every single fan in the state of Michigan, whether you root for a team or not, is fired up about this week because it's one of the greatest rivalries in all of college football and one of the greatest rivalries that we have in the state of Michigan. We're going to get the program moving so you can hear from the guys, but uh, we just want to thank some of our sponsors, important people who we wouldn't be here without. Golden Limousine, Big Real Estate, <laughs> Team Wellness, Eddie V's, Fogo de Chao, Extreme Metals, Wilson Sports, American Coney Island, Uncle Ray's Chips, which you're enjoying on your table, I hope, and also Fago Soda. Um, we have one order of business that is um, non-related, non-game related, that we would be remiss if we did not um, take care of here today. On October 8th, we lost a very dear friend to the DSMA, Tom Skinner. And for those of you who are familiar with Tom and know about his passion, he was all about his students at Montrose High School and showing them the way in the broadcast world and giving them the tools they need to succeed, creating experiences for them. And he sent so many aspiring broadcasters and journalists out on their way into the world and uh, his death leaves a very large hole that will not easily be filled. But um, some folks at Montrose are doing their best to do that. But as an organization, the Detroit Sports Media Association wanted to honor Tom Skinner for... Stand by. for everything that he has done for our organization and also for students in this field. So today we are going to um, establish the Thomas E. Skinner Scholarship Award. And it will be given out each year to a student who exemplifies the passion, the drive, the commitment, the work ethic, and community that Tom so easily demonstrated with everyone. If you met Tom, you were a friend to Tom. Um, I'm now going to bring up one of his colleagues, um, Jamie Kitts, who is going to speak a little bit and uh, help us present our first Thomas E. Skinner Scholarship winner. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to everybody. What a wonderfully attended event this is. This is the one thing Tom looked forward to every year to taking students here and giving them the opportunity to, to meet everyone at the Detroit Sports Media and, and all you wonderful people. And especially this year, it's, just, it's, it's an epic build up to a, what do you think is gonna be an epic game. But I wanted to just mention the recipient of this first uh, Thomas E. Skinner scholarship. 
and it's a young man I know well. His name is Gabe Patterson. Gabe was with our digital media program for three years, never said a word for the first six weeks in class, and by the end of his third year, you couldn't get him to shut up. <laughs> and he, he found a home with us. He did over 100 games with us, and especially I want to lift him up during the pandemic when the, the MHSAA just really lowered the number of people in our crew. All but one event. He, we did 45 events, and he did 44 out of 45 events during the pandemic. And, you know, we're a, a live streaming organization, and, you know, six to 8,000 people sometimes would watch our games, which is pretty good for high school streaming. But during the pandemic, Gabe was always there, and he had, uh, intends to enroll in Specs Howard as soon as they get going across the street at, at uh, Lawrence Tech. Gabe. Oh, he, by the way, he's helping with the live stream right now. <laughs> so on behalf of the Detroit Sports Media Association, congratulations, Gabe. Um, if you can just say a couple words. I'm sure Tom would be very proud of you. Yeah, uh, I'm not too good at these things, but uh, I I'm really grateful for this, honestly. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I'm just flattered to have this little award. Tom Skinner was really a, a good mentor to me. You know, he would help substitute in school. He, would, he taught me most of the things I know how to do with media. You know, he taught me what camera angles, what all the sports terms meant, so I know when the goal looked like down down the field when we're making a play. And yeah, he was just, he was a really good teacher to me. He taught me a lot of good things. Don't try don't try to cash this. You might have a problem. All right, without further ado, we are going to kick off the festivities with the players we have here. And to do that is our honorable master of ceremonies, my colleague and friend, Eli Zaret. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Believe it or not, this is my ninth consecutive year of hosting this event. Hold your applause, please. Hold your applause. Um, I'm not sure why I keep on getting asked back, but Bill Harrington keeps on asking me back, so I come. And I got to tell you, at this stage of my career, gasping and sputtering unceremoniously towards its end, I really need this gig. So I'm so glad to be back again, to have a microphone in my hand and people actually listening for as long as they do. Let's mention some of the celebrities here because I forget to do that every year. Uh, I saw him earlier, former uh, television uh, newsman, uh, great investigative reporter, also worked for the local papers and now has his own podcast called Soul, Soul of Detroit. Is ML Elric in the crowd? There he is, let's hear it for ML. He writes for the Detroit News, a very fine sports writer here at the head table, Tony Paul. Let's hear it for Tony Paul. He was my street reporter. I shouldn't say my street reporter because he uh, he's done many, many things, but celebrating his 40th year in the business, 17 in Detroit, now 18 in Lansing, one of the great reporters I ever worked with, Fred Human. Let's hear it for Fred Human. And of course, my colleague, Jennifer Hammond. Let's hear it for her, not just for what she does here, but for the fine work she's done on television all these years. If I've forgotten anybody, I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. I was going to save him for later, but yes. My former classmate at Michigan, also 43 years doing play-by-play -play and color now for Michigan football. We're going to hear more from him later. He's a member of the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame, a great friend and a great broadcaster, the big man, Jim Brandstatter. Let's hear it for Jimmy B. We'll hear more from him later. <clears throat> this rivalry is about, it's about the games, it's about the stories, it's about the moments, it's about the quotes even. And for me, the biggest quote came not from what you're thinking, not from 2007, we'll get into that later. The biggest quote ever in the history of this rivalry, I believe happened after the great 1978 game when Michigan State came to Ann Arbor as heavy underdogs. They were on probation. They'd lost their coach, Denny Stoltz, because of that. And behind the infamous passing combination of Eddie Smith and Kirk Gibson, 
They stunned the Wolverines 24 to 15, one of the great upsets ever in this game. And later that year at the Michigan State football banquet, Darrell Rogers, the coach, stood up, and I guess he didn't know whether this would become public or not. I guess we've learned since then that everything you do, even what you think becomes public, because somebody's got a camera on you. He said, and it's an exaggeration, but he said, the fact is, it's an exaggeration, that those fans and people in Michigan are arrogant asses. And, you know, it's true. Not Oh, fully true, it's an exaggeration, but that's part of the crux of this rivalry also. This is what makes it great and contributes to all the banter. Michigan has always portrayed itself and been portrayed as the Harvard on the Hudson, the pristine academic institution. It is harder to get in, and, and contrasted by you know, the, the humble agrarians from East Lansing uh, who you know, are just down to earth and, and you know, uh, uh, follow the, the dictate of George Perlis, which was play hard, keep your mouth shut, and good things will happen. And the Spartans have followed that because uh, since the Daryl Rogers quote for sure. And we all play it up a little bit. I know I have. I've been in front of this group in the past, and I've said the truth. I got so many friends that went to Michigan State, so many I've worked with, including Gibson, who I just mentioned, Greg Kelser, all the people in the business that I've worked with. My daughters went to the school, and of course I said to this group, for those who were here, and I might have gone there too, but my SAT scores are just a little bit too high. So that's the cheap shots that's part of the rivalry. That's part of what makes it great. That's part of what makes it, and so, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm part of the arrogance as well. Um, so cheap shots is part of the history, and that's why I calling this game, the return to the crime scene, which is Mike Hart returning after, uh, since 2007 when he made the famous quote, just a little, just a little throwaway, just a little, little poke that he thought would just evaporate into the ether after Michigan trailing 24 to 14 with seven minutes to go behind Chad Henney and a little bit uh, Hart who had a sprained ankle, uh, said to the world, what's the quote here? You've read it in the paper this week. I thought it was funny. Sometimes you get your little brother excited when you're playing basketball and let him lead, then you just come back and take it back. That was 14 years ago, and it lives to this day. And Mark D'Antonio brilliantly seized upon that by saying, what was he say about something about, oh, uh, I find the things they do amusing, but remember, pride comes before the fall. They want to mock us, but I'm telling them they can print that crap all they want. I'm going to be coach here for a long time. It's not over. It's just starting. And yes, the little brother has done quite well since then. It's like the little brother at home that grows six inches over the one summer and then starts kicking your ass to make up for all the torment you've dealt him in all the years and you were growing up. So anyway, <laughs> and this week we did have a little bulletin board item. Braylon Edwards said something about Michigan State's defense not being very good. I don't know, well, we'll get to the players later whether this really holds or is that all over after the first play of the game, but we know the arrogant asses and the little brother are two things that make this rivalry so great. Anyway, both teams at 7-0, and we're ready to go. Let's introduce our esteemed panel today. We've got some great players here. I'm going to stand to the side as I invite them up. Let's start with a center, a three-year letterman at Michigan, won the Raider Award as Michigan's top offensive lineman in 2014, starting all 12 games that year. He is Jack Miller. Let's hear it for Jack Miller. By the way, Jack is in commercial real estate. Anybody who wants to upgrade the, real, the, the insurance in their office, see Jack after the show. Uh, a Detroit prep star at Detroit Crockett. He made All-State on defense at the same time. He was All-Metro Detroit as quarterback. At State, he began his career as a cornerback, played wide receiver one year, led Michigan State in catches, and was first-team All-Big Ten as a senior. Drafted by the Dolphins in 15, started as a cornerback in 16, went on to play with the Giants, Bengals in 18 and 19. Let's hear it for Tony Lippett. Tony Lippett. A tight end, he was first team All-American playing in Ohio. As a junior at Michigan, he was first team All-American by Sports Illustrated and CBS Sports. Also won the uh, prestigious Ozzie Newsom Award as the best tight end in the country. Of course, I'm talking about Jake Butt. Let's hear it for Jake Butt. As a sophomore in 2013, was named team MVP. Beat Ohio State memorably for the Big Ten Championship. 
led him to a Rose Bowl victory over Stanford, where he was named the offensive MVP, and that's just the start of it. As a junior, he quarterback the Spartans to a Cotton Bowl victory over Baylor. As a senior, beat Iowa in the Big Ten championship game, where again, he was named MVP. He owns Sparty records. Get this, total offense, passing yards, and TD tosses, was 34-5 and in his career at quarterback, the most wins of any quarterback in school history, taken by the Raiders in round four, signed by four NFL teams, and is now in commercial real estate. Of course, I'm talking about Connor Cook. Connor Cook. So I'm going to move back here, and anybody who has a question, you can kind of let me know, but I will start out by asking a few questions. And let's start with the rivalry itself. You guys can go across the board here. Uh, what does it mean to you in general terms? Let's start with Jack. Is the rivalry something that you just uh, uh, work past or play past, or is it something that really infects you as a, as a Michigan player? Yeah, can uh, everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Jack Miller. I'm not Will Campbell in your program. If anyone was confused, I was a second-round draft pick today, but that's, that's okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, as far as the rivalry goes, um, well, you see what it means. That's why, that's why we're all here today, right? You can see the tradition and the pageantry that this game has. Um, I, I think that I, I grew up in Ohio. Three of us grew up in Ohio. Um, and so I didn't really know much about this rivalry until – getting to Ann Arbor and then realized how personal it was uh, for so many people here for a lot of the reasons, Eli, that you uh, so eloquently said just a little bit ago. So um, it is a different game. It does have a different feel. I think particularly this year, 7-0, and 7-0, and, and, and how much is on the line with this. Uh, it's special. And uh, like I said, by virtue of the fact that we're all here today, you can see that. And, uh, okay, next be, be Jake. And, and Jake, add two. Uh, and you can go back to Jack when you're done, if so. Uh, what does the rivalry mean to you, and what's your number one memory from the, th uh, from the years you played against Michigan State? Well, the number one memory was beating them my senior year. Um, at, at Any time you win that game, that's, that's, that's going to rise to the top. But um, just like Jack, I grew up in Ohio. I actually grew up in Columbus, Ohio, so I grew up around the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. Um, <laughs> we can I, all agree on that. There's yeah, a yeah, little we, murmur we, in the crowd. That, that's the only <laughs> common ground Michigan and Michigan State fans might find. But um, And then I played in Denver. I played in some big rivalries where it was, you know, uh, Denver versus the Oakland Raiders versus the Kansas City Chiefs. But out of all those rivalries, this game really stands by itself because I think – to be honest with you guys, I think it's built on hatred. We really don't like them. They know it. They don't really like us. Um, and when we take the field, we know it's going to be a fist fight every single time. So I think that's only amplified this year with both teams being undefeated. There's a lot, a lot on the line. And, um, you know, being a, being a Michigan guy, I really think that this game's important for us to go in there and win and really take that next step forward for our program. Connor, is it, is it, is it really hate? Um, because you know so many of these guys, and you play with some of these guys, and you see them all the time. I think, and this is, people are going to boo me, I think there's a lot of love that goes on, except when it's game day, and except when you're talking about it. Because we, 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 we love, I mean, like I said, my daughters went to Michigan State. How many households have husbands and wives that went to different schools? What's it like for you? Do you agree? Is it about hatred, or is it about competitiveness, or what? Um, I think once you get out there, kind of is about hatred. I mean, because you're... you're <laughs> There goes that theory. <laughs> it's, there's, you know, you, you turn it on. You, you flip the switch on when you go out there and you're, you're playing. When you're off the field and you, you see guys out and about, I mean, J Jake and I were just chatting about how, you know, summer going into my senior year, we were hanging out at Torch Lake over the summer. You know, you see each other out and about. You're friendly. You're cordial. Um, and it doesn't mean you can't be friends afterwards, but it's just there's something about the game. And, and me, I'm also from Ohio, and I grew up on the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. I didn't know about the Michigan-Michigan State rivalry. And like Jack said, when I came to Michigan State, and you see these kids who grew up in, in Michigan, and that's their rivalry. Our rivalry was OSU Michigan. You come in and you meet all these guys and you're around 100, 100 dudes, you know, 80% of them are from Michigan, and all they're talking about is the Michigan Michigan State game. And you see what it means to them, and over the years, it becomes your rivalry, and it, it means so much to you. So um, you're friendly off the field, when you're in between the lines, it's about hatred. You're doing whatever you possibly can to win that game, you know, for obviously your own sake, for your teammates, for the program, for the school, um, because we know how much it means to all of the Spartans out there, alumni, current Spartans, you know, past Spartans, any Spartan. 
it, it's a huge game. But um, you do kind of <laughs> you hate them, but you respect them. Yeah, you respect them. Yeah, you, yeah. you respect them. It doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with them right. either. So you're a good guy, Connor. Yeah, and Jack and I. Jack, <laughs> yeah, we we grew up together. We, we grew played, up. We, we played we, basketball together. Yeah. So we, he was from Strongsville. I grew up in Parma. It's like a 10-minute drive outside of Cleveland. And we played travel basketball for like yeah. two, three, three, two, three years with each other. Yeah. So, so you can care for somebody and still want to just kick his ass our, on Saturday. Our basketball team was stacked, too. We had yeah. Jack, who was a Big Ten <laughs> football player, me. We had another dude go play basketball at Iowa and another football player go play football at, at Iowa as yeah. well. So we, we were a stacked team. Just, just so everyone knows. Well, <laughs> well Tony, it's interesting what, what um, Connor said about playing for Spartans past and present and everything and all the fans. Does that responsibility, knowing what it means beyond just the locker room, the importance it has to other people that are with you, does that, what does that add to the game or does that, that, that make a difference? Um, the, game is, the game is tough. The game is going to be tough anyway. It's like, um, like you said, I'm from Michigan. I'm from Detroit, so I know about the rivalry a little bit more. Like, I know about the Michigan Ohio State rivalry, but I know about the Michigan Michigan State rivalry even more. And with the whole in-state rivalry, most of the guys on the team, 200 guys on each team, compared at least 90 percent of them guys are from Michigan. A lot of us played against each other growing up, from little league to high school to college. So it kind of get built up throughout the time and. Um, it's a big game. Like it's definitely hating that game. I feel like le the week leading up to that game is is none like any other week. Like we know when the Michigan is on that schedule and when they come up and we got practice on that Tuesday, we know like every day is like a r it's a real day of practice. Like we really locking in because we know how big this game is. And this game big. It's not no. It's not a regular season game. It's not a regular game. It's kind of like a playoff game. And um, we bring that type of intensity and passion to the game. And we know on that Saturday. <laughs> It get real out there, like from the beginning, from they, from the time they pull up to the stadium, from the time you wake up in the morning, from the time everything, it's like you locked in totally until that game is over. And yeah. It just brings a different passion and intensity to the game. So um, yeah. I definitely say that. Not, some of my best memories from that game is, uh, I'll probably say one of my best memories, it didn't even come in the game. I was a scout team quarterback for Denard Robinson one year. And that <laughs> week, like it was just a whole week like uh. We got to stop him because he was in the Heisman. We got to stop him. We got to do this new that. I played quarterback in high school. So that week I was like, yeah. I'm about to show out because <laughs> I played quarterback anyway. So I'm about to go crazy. And that entire week, like, I gave, like, the defense, like, fits. So when they came out there and went against Denard Robinson, it was kind of, I wasn't going to say it's easy, but, I mean, it you, is what it is. You, you know? really so, played a role. You, you felt yeah, good. I mean, yeah, yeah. So that was a big memory, though, from that game, just um, getting the defense ready. I didn't even play in the game or anything like that. I was just a freshman. So just preparing in that way before I could even step on into this rivalry and actually play, that was a big memory for me and for the team. So I'll say that. There's, um, I think there's probably more bitter endings for Michigan than Michigan State over the years. I'm thinking of the, the, the bitch fest after, 80, uh, after uh, Desmond Howard was tripped in the, in the end zone and everybody saw it, but the officials lost that one. Of course, the Spartan Bob play in 2001. Everybody knows the clock stopped, except the clock guy himself. But the self-inflicted wound in 2015, hey, okay, it's a bitch fest, all right? The, 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 um, the play in 2015 was the self-inflicted wound, and a few of you guys were on the field for that. The, absolutely the most stunning ending uh, in, I think, the entire rivalry. Jake, tell us about your experience that day, and at the end of that game, was, was it Jay, uh, Jalen Watts? Yep. Who recovered? Well, I'm actually the guy that separated his hip. I'm the one that tackled him into the end zone. So, I mean, he wasn't getting out scotch-free on that day. But, you know, we're sitting there, and, and I'm off on the sideline. We're, we're anticipating a Hail Mary. And they were going to put me in on defense all week. I was going to be the jump ball guy to bat it down. So we're already anticipating, you know, a clean punt, and they're going to chuck up a Hail Mary. Well, we get out there to punt, and typically you have, you know, Michigan would have two guys on each side out wide to go – you know, run down and tackle the punt returner. And Michigan State would have one guy over each of them and a punt returner back. Well, when we line up, they have all 11 guys getting ready to rush the punt. So we were a couple men short. We had no check to bring these guys in, and, and we had no answer for that. So I'm sitting there back in the shield, um, about seven yards back behind the snapper, and the ball gets snapped, and I just see a sea of white come through. Way, too ma way more guys than I'd seen all season. And I'm like, oh, oh shoot, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> 
So you can't see what's going on behind you, but you can feel the energy in the stadium, and you can you can hear the ball get kicked. And you know the the it's taken a little taken a little while, and you hear a gasp come out of the the crowd, and you and you know something's not right. So I look back, and the ball bounces one one hop. Michigan State picks it up, and they just got a convoy of like seven eight guys running down the field. So I just start running, taking off. Maybe, man, this is just crazy, you know. <laughs> And it comes right down. We're on the pylon. A bang, bang play. Can I, can I punch the ball out? Can I, can I tackle him and keep him out of the end zone? Obviously, I couldn't tackle him, and I'll, and I'll lay there. And I'll just never forget how quiet 110,000 fans were. Oh. I mean, I had my eyes closed, and, and truly, it felt like I was having an out-of-body experience for the next five minutes, even going back into the locker room. We were all, did that really just happen? You know, at that point, we had Coach Harbaugh. We were having a successful season. We really wanted to beat our rivalry. And, again, we're trying to turn the program around. And it, it was just one of the craziest things to be a part of. Um, but I, I think that's part of the Michigan State week is you got to be ready for some, some strange things to happen. It truly is a one-of-one one game. Um, typically, you know, Michigan State has a, has a good trick play up on special teams or offense or defense. And um, that's something that they do really, really well. So you got to anticipate anything and everything. And, and I think that play just exemplifies that. And I believe you were there, too, at that time, Connor. Were you not? I was. Probably a different reaction than Jake had, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, so um, we went for it on fourth – or no. Yeah, we went for it on fourth down. I think we were down two at the time. And there was, you know, a little over two minutes, maybe a little under two minutes. I can't really remember. But there was a little amount of time left on the clock. And uh, I come off the field, and we gave it back to Michigan. And, you know, season's over. We lost to Michigan. I beat them my sophomore year, my junior year. Lost to him my senior year. I'm never going to forget this. You know, all the, the trash talk I'm going to hear on social media, people commenting on all my pictures, all the Michigan fans saying what a horrible quarterback I am <laughs> and what a, you know, how I suck at football and everything. And I really wasn't looking forward to that and letting all of Spartan Nation down. And we were so close to, to winning. Um, so I was just sitting there kind of just minding my own business. And our, our quarterback coach, Brad Salem, was to my right where Tony is. And he's like, hey, don't you worry. Our defense is going to go get a stop right here. We're, we're going to get the ball back. We're going to go win this game. You watch. You watch right here. And it's like the last thing I wanted to hear because, yeah, we stopped. You know, we stopped the Wolverines. We held them, I think, three and out. They were getting ready to punt. And there was 10 seconds left. And the chances of us getting that ball back, you know, the, the punter is going to boot it deep. The chances of us actually really winning that game slim to none. You know, the game was over, basically. And as soon as the ball was kind of skipped or dropped or picked up and hit and deflected you know me and brad kind of grab each other and we were only down two points i believe and jalen had the ball maybe on the 25 yard 30 yard line 35 yard line he starts running i'm like run out of bounds like i don't want him to get tackled yeah. and then you know the time runs out or gives us a bad opportunity I'm like just get out of bounds get out of bounds we'll bring the field goal unit out and we'll kick a game-winning field goal and it just seemed like 10 seconds seemed like five minutes of just watching <laughs> us, you know, the convoy that Jake was talking about, the sea of convoy of white just like slowly making their way to the end zone. And then he gets tackled. Everyone's looking around. Were there any flags? Um, where's the referee? Is he signaling a touchdown? And when he signaled a touchdown and everyone ran out on the field, me and Brad are just like jumping up and down like two girls i don't even know like we were it was you can't even put into words you know they can't even put into words how it felt to lose the, a game like that we couldn't even put into words how it felt to win a game like that and it was just pure adrenaline pure excitement um and it was just it's you know to win a game like that against your rivalry on the road um to keep your you know playoff hopes alive keep your you know big 10 championship hopes alive um I mean, you look at all the crazy plays that have happened in college football, you know, that's right up there, top five, maybe top ten, top five. The greatest play ever in Spartan history, in my opinion. The greatest play to ever happen, obviously, within the rivalry. So um, crazy, crazy experience. And, you know, we were so lucky, very lucky that that happened to us. Yeah, you don't run into things like that out in regular life, the, the incredible ups and downs and, and exhilaration and, and depression that happens in sports. So I want to ask you guys what you miss about it. Um, start with you, Jack. Um, you were a center, which is not a glamour position, but you were you were there. It was exciting. You 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 you're play play an important role. What do you miss? What don't you have anymore in your life, if anything, that you had when you played football? Well, there's <clears throat> there's two answers. One uh, very real and not so diplomatic. You don't have an outlet to take out your anger sometimes, right? <laughs> Being able to go run into somebody at full speed <laughs> is a good way to get rid of stress. Um, 
But no, I, I think honestly, it's it's the camaraderie in the locker room, right? I mean, just the four of us, two of us not even playing together, get over here and you just you have that sense of brotherhood together. Um, you know, I, I say all the time, I'm so lucky and grateful that I had a team sport that I was able to run with for a long time to help mold me into the person that I think I am today. And I think that there's, um, you know, a lot of people out there that don't have that team spirit feel and, and being a part of something bigger than yourself, right? Sacrificing for the greater good of, of something more important than just the individual. And, uh, you know, it's tough, right? I mean, everyone sees 12 Saturdays out of the year and goes, my goodness, you know, how fortunate, how great was that? And don't get me wrong, it was the most exhilarating, rewarding experience that you could ever ask for. The other 350 days a year are tough. They're really brutal, right? And so, but you're in it together, right? You're with your brothers, you're with your coaches, and you're all going for one common goal together. That's a pretty special bond. That's not something that I think you can find very easily in life. And uh, we're all fortunate enough to have had that. So let's start with Tony. I don't, uh, what, what do you, you know, you, you played pro ball after your career with several teams. Now I think your career may be over. How do you look towards the future? And um, will you be able to look forward to any, finding the type of excitement you had in football? Um, I look forward to everything. I feel like everything happened for a reason, and the best is yet to come. I mean, I enjoy my times at Michigan State. I enjoy the rivalry. I enjoy playing ball in the NFL. I enjoy it all. You know, it's all the experience. It's all it's what we're here to do, experience, right? So I'm, I'm kind, of, kind, of, kind of cool with it. I kind of love it. I kind of enjoy it. And, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a big week. I, I missed the week. I'll probably say that. I missed, the, like, the week leading up to it, like the entire week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the preparation, like right after we play them, the 365 go right back up on the wall. Like that's the only team we put a, a 365 clock up for anybody. You feel me? Like as soon as the game over, like it's literally in the locker room the next Monday, 365, they back on the clock. So it's like you miss those. You miss the times. You miss the bonding. You miss the hard work. You miss the, the, the passion that come from it. You miss your teammates. You miss the moments. You miss the fans. You miss all of this. You feel what I'm saying? So. I'm glad I was able to enjoy it and embrace it when it was happening. And like I said, I'm glad to be here to see a lot of familiar faces and see y'all, you know. So that's what I miss about it for sure. Connor, uh, you played for Mark D'Antonio, who had an incredible, incredibly successful run there. What was he like as a coach? And um, what was your relationship like with him and, and as a quarterback and, and the coach? Yeah, Coach D was amazing. Um, he was a defensive coach, wasn't really an offense. He wasn't really involved uh, with the offense a whole lot. Um, you know, you have defensive minded head coaches like Coach D, you have offensive minded coaches like Urban Meyer, you know, just as, using it as an example, you know, the offensive coach is heavily involved with the players on offense, you know, everything that they do is geared towards that. The reason why our defense was always so great is obviously we had Coach D who was defensive minded, spending a lot of time with the defense and obviously Pat Narduzzi um, beneath him. But, but Coach D was just such an amazing leader. Um, he had, you know, such a great staff around him that, that helped him and that he helped them. It was a great relationship that everyone had, and they were there for so long. He, um, you know, was, was hard on his guys, and he was, he was pretty old school. And you see, you know, coaches now, you know, they're new school. They're players' coaches. You know, they're, they're, they have these great relationships with them, and they're like buddy-buddy. I mean, you were never going to be buddy-buddy with Coach Antonio. I mean, he had this look on his face at all times. But man, was he an awesome coach and an amazing leader and just a leader of men. Like people looked to him, they looked up to him, um, you know, and he always came through. He knew how to coach these kids, you know, through and through in big games and games that, you know, we're playing against teams that we know we're supposed to blow out. He always just set the great example to all of us, you know, to, to be focused, prepare, focus on, you know, the task at hand, never look too far ahead. And uh, yeah, my relationship with him is good. You know, it, you know, we catch up every once in a while. I know he's retired up in Michigan and um, haven't seen him in a while, but know that he's doing well. And Jake, so you're, you're about to start your post football career now. You played at Michigan, you played in the pros for three or four years. What do you think you took from Michigan? What lessons did you learn? How did it make you as a man? And how do you think you'd be able to use that moving forward? Definitely. Um, and to kind of, there's a story to go back about what I remember most about, you know, college football and, and, and what it did for me is, you know, playing in the NFL, it's, there, it's like the golden egg, you know, everybody, it's the big stage, but there's some about college football and it's like Jack touched on is it's the camaraderie is it's a brotherhood is, you know, you wake up, you, you do your 6am lifts with your, with your friends, you go to class with your friends, 
you practice with your friends, um, you live with them, you go to study hall together. So you're creating this bond over four years. Um, there's obviously no trades or cuts. So you get to know these guys on a day to day basis over four years. There's a strong, strong connection about that. And, you know, the thing about football is it challenges you every single day, um, emotionally, physically, mentally. Um, it doesn't make logical sense to wake up at 5.30 a.m. and walk through a couple inches of snow to get to a 6 a.m. lift in the middle of winter, you know? It's tough. You don't want to do that. But behind that doubt and that, that challenge is a great reward. But when you can do it with your brothers and guys that you care about so much, it's that much more special. And, you know, through my injuries, what I've learned is, um, you know, we're all going to face tough times and adversity in our life. But to kind of look at the, your adversity through a curious lens and, and ask, what is life trying to teach me? Um, it, it kind of relieves some of that pain. And, and you learn is, if you could just make it through the other side of the smoke, you're going to come out a better person, a better man, um, and, and better at whatever your career is that you're, you're doing at that time. Adversity builds character, as they say. Uh, how about you, Jack? Um, you're, in the, you're in the business world now. What, what, do, you, what, what do you miss? And, and, and tell us a story from from maybe your days at Michigan that kind of exemplifies what it was all about. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I got a good story for the rivalry's sake. Um, I, I can't remember. I think it was my sophomore year, and I, I wasn't starting at the time. I was on the backup team for field goal, and somebody got hurt or a helmet came off. Somebody couldn't be in the game. So I run out there all happy, right, and, uh, hey, I'm going to get a snap. This is awesome. Now, you're, it's cold, right? It's this time of year, and you're standing on the sidelines freezing. You're not warmed up. You have no tempo for how fast to go, and it's field goal, so sometimes guys aren't really going that hard. It was a kick. It wasn't a field goal. And uh, it was a learning lesson because whoever came off the ball on the other side of me absolutely destroyed me, and I said, well, this game's for real, so I better, <laughs> I better show up next time. Um, but, now, you know, I, I'd go back to what, what Jake said about, um, you know, the, the, the brotherhood of this thing, um, you know, there's there's a reason you know that we're that we're sitting here today people care a lot about these institutions about the game of football there's something uh magical about it right i mean i think these guys would agree that 2015 game was magic for the spartans not for the wolverines right there's a certain aura that surrounds college football surrounds games like this that makes it special and uh you don't maybe appreciate that when you're in the moment as much as you do now when you can sit back and you know, memory's kind, and the older you get, the better you were. Well, I think we should talk about the game a little bit, and the what's what's hard about that for me. Like last year, I believe Michigan was, I don't know, three touchdown favorites and lost the game. So we're not very good at predicting what's going to happen, and that seems to be one of the great cliches as you throw out the record book, et cetera, et cetera. And both these teams are a lot better than anybody thought they would be. I think the over-under on the Spartans was four wins for the season. They've already surpassed that. Uh, less less than two months in, so let's go down the road. What do you do? You have a feel for this game? Of course, the Michigan guy is going to say Michigan's going to win, and the Spartan guy says Spartan's going to win. But what do you think the elements are that will make the difference in this game, if any? Yeah, I think um, I think both teams are are built pretty similarly and built for games like this, right? I, I think it's probably going to come down to who can limit big plays. I think the Spartans are pretty dangerous offensively, and if they can. You know, if they can put up some big plays, I think it might be tough for Michigan. Um, if Michigan can run the ball effectively like they do and, and, and establish that and have that as their bread and butter, they, they might be okay. I think a big factor is going to be uh, not, from Michigan's standpoint, is not letting Michigan State get out to an early start. If that crowd gets going and it's a hostile environment and it's back and forth, that's when those big plays do make a difference. You know, I'm a little biased, but if Michigan can get that running game going early and, uh, and maybe themselves get out to an early start, I uh, like the Wolverines. How about you, Jake? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we were all talking about it, and there's a stat that in the, in the recent years, whoever's won the, the rushing battle has won the game. So I, I think Jack just said it is, is can you win the rushing battle? And I think that's important because in a game like this, it's a massive rivalry. There's a lot of emotion for Michigan going on the road. I mean, the Michigan State fans are right behind your bench. They're yeah. spitting on you. They're saying things I can't repeat here while we're, <laughs> while we're all hanging out. Um, so there's just a, there, it's just an energetic environment. So if you can go out there and run the ball and sustain drives, it takes the crowd out of a little bit. 
kind of settles your nerves. It gets you in a rhythm. Um, it allows you to just feel good about, you know, putting together eight to ten play drives, seven minute long drives, and putting points on the board. So um, we got really we got a staple of running backs, two of the best backs in the league. The, the offensive line's been playing really, really well. And our defense, I think, has taken a, a really big step forward with our new court, uh, defensive coordinator this year. So if we can just do what we've done throughout the season, I think we have a better team. Uh, I think we're more talented. So uh, <laughs> what do you guys want me to say? You know what I mean? Uh, so I think if we can just go out there and do what we do, ultimately I, I do think Michigan can win this game. But it's Michigan State. It's going to be a tough battle. And, and Connor, when, when you give your answer, throwing about Peyton Thorne, who seems to have come out of basically nowhere, maybe he should have played last year, I don't know, and has done very, very well. So talk about how you see the game and, and maybe your impressions of him so far. Do I have a Kirk Herbstreit and Chris Fowler sitting right next to me? You guys should be on college game day. Jeez. <laughs> good. Um, I'm not going to give that much of an in-depth analysis. Uh, Michigan, obviously, better at running. They're not as good. They're not as balanced as Michigan State. You know, their passing game could be better. They have a great running back and a great O-line. Defense is stout. Um, Michigan State, good in all three phases. We haven't – it's been, you know, since Keyshawn Martin, since we've had a returner who can take it to the house in Jaden Reed. Um, whether if it's a punt, if it's a kick return, um, and when you have a dangerous player like that on special teams, special teams can totally, as we all know, yeah. can totally change the outcome of a game. Um, you know, de uh, defensively, Michigan State has very stout defense per usual, and uh, offensively, there's playmakers. I don't, I don't know exactly where Michigan State's offense ranks, but I know they're pretty high up there in the nation uh, for explosive plays. Um, which is above 20 yards, and I, I did see another stat that they were in the top five or something for plays over 60 yards or something. So um, they're fun to watch on offense. And uh, Peyton Thorne, I mean, he's doing stuff that, that I wasn't even doing as a senior, and he's only a sophomore. So I think he has like 15 passing touchdowns, four picks. He's not turning it over. Um, he's almost at 2,000 yards already right now, which is great. Um, the, the offensive coordinator, uh, J Coach Johnson, I believe, is dialing up like deep deep passes early and often like you know i would have loved to play in that offense with tony lippett you know at my receiver you know dialing up you know throwing the ball deep on first and ten second and ten you know um airing it out early often and in the red zone so um obviously i'm gonna I thought you weren't gonna go that in depth connor <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> Obviously, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> we, I am riding with my Spartans, you know, through and through. It's gonna be, a, it's gonna be no matter what, you know. Like they say, you throw out the records, you know. It's gonna be, it's, it's not gonna be a blowout, you know. It's gonna be a close game, but I think the Spartans are gonna come out on top. It's a shock. So, you know, Tony, I think uh, maybe Michigan State's got two of the, the most dynamic offensive players in this game, and Naylor. And then Walker, the running back, who just came over from Wake Forest. How do you assess them, and what are your thoughts on the game? Um, I think we got playmakers all over the field. I think our quarterback is a playmaker. I think number one, Jalen Reed, Neller, they both playmakers. I feel like we got a Heisman running back. So I feel like we, we, we can dominate on offense and against any team. And um, offense line playing good. Like he said, the offense coordinator is dialing up plays that definitely me and Connor would love to, you know, <laughs> play in these offenses and finish games. And, and extend records like like we like he already have now, but um, I think Michigan is a good team. I mean, I like their uh, they running backs, pretty physical guys. They kind of getting back to their old ways of you know playing physical ball, running the ball, you know throwing the ball when they can and throwing the ball when they have to. But you know turning around, handing the ball off, having a stout defense and things like that. But um, I think it's gonna be a good game. I definitely feel like Michigan State gonna win <laughs> uh, for sure. I, don't, I feel like we got a lot of playmakers. I feel like we got the guys. Um, I mean, if you're going to win, you got to come in there and take it. You have to come in there and, you know, I don't care about all the talking and all that. You have to come in there and play, put your pass on and play. So it don't really matter about the talking or anything like that. But I feel like we're going to win. I feel like we're the better team. And it's been that way. If anybody has a question, I'll stand over here. You can come and uh, tap me on the shoulder. You know, I, I think the off-the-field stuff doesn't, doesn't really affect the game. And I think some of it's been very interesting. What do you guys think, and I hope this isn't too uh, theoretical, but the name, image, and likeness that has changed the game, finally given some players a chance to make some money. I've always felt that, you know, um, although it's a great experience, uh, when the coaches are making 10, 15 million, and ESPN and all the networks are making millions and millions and billions, that some more should go to the players. Are you glad to see this happen? Anybody who wants to answer that, go right ahead. Um, you know, definitely. And I, I think you touched on is that someone's making that money, you know, someone's make, you know, monetizing the brand. And 
really, you know, the players are a big driving factor of pushing that brand, especially when the team's succeeding. You know, I'm sure sales are going up all across the, you know, the campus and the town. So I think it's 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 really great that guys are able to get a piece of that. And you, you worry, you know, you're balancing a lot as a student athlete. You got class, you got your workouts, you know, you got obviously your, your sport to deal with, your girlfriend, your friends. So I, I think we're in the Wild West right now. It's new. I think we're figuring things out. We're going to have to kind of figure this out as we go. But as long as there's systems in place to make sure guys, you know, understand that it's football first, school second, as long as you're doing those things and succeeding, the money's going to come. I think it's a system that it's an absolute no-brainer and is going to really help a lot of guys. You know, for me, I got injured. You know, I didn't have the NFL career I thought I was going to have. But when I looked around the stadium back in uh, back in my time in Ann Arbor, there was 88 jerseys. There was butt, butt shirts all around. I wasn't able to monetize that. So you could argue that my most – you know, the, the, the time where I could have made the most money off the field was my time here in Ann Arbor, and I didn't get to see any of that. I'm not salty about it, but I'm glad that the mm -hmm. next guys, you know, the, the guys are able to, uh, you know, now do it today. Yeah, the high-profile players would do more. Connor, you, you could have cleaned up. I would like to know what a butt shirt looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to say it. It's, it's cheap shots, great. like I said. It makes the great. rivalry great. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I could have made a, a lot of money, you know, well, with all the 18, you know, jerseys being sold. And, you know, uh, there was, you know, I was on some billboards, uh, other T-shirts, other stuff that they want to make. But, but yeah, like Jake said, it's a no-brainer. I mean, for how hard you work as a student athlete, bouncing class, the workouts, the, what, you know, the toll that you take on your body, you know, everything, the, the, the social life, the physical, like the mental, it, it's so much stress on you physically and mentally. Um, they deserve some some kind of money, they, yeah. and you know, like bringing in all the money, you know, the games, you know, every, the, all the stuff on TV. There's just so much stuff that's going around because of the players. You take the players away, what do you have? Nothing. Yeah. So you know, the players are the driving force. Um, they deserve something, and and we're all happy to see it because it's yeah. it's very well deserving. And that. they'll find out it doesn't ruin the game. It probably even makes it more right. engrossing. Okay, uh, got a question from the crowd. What's your name? Uh, Mark Edwards. Gentlemen, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Eli. Uh, we know that you guys all mentioned the run game. If it's not the run game, what is it that will be the phase or who could be the potential unsung hero for this game? And then also we know that you guys all picked Sparty and you, you picked Michigan. What will the score be? Will it be a high score, low score? What do you guys think? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say some of the guys you probably look out for, I like uh like I said I like the uh, running backs in Michigan I like number two uh, Haskins if I'm not if I'm not mistaken no, like twenty five is Haskins and okay, two is two Coram, Coram, okay, yeah. I like I like both of those guys yeah. they can run the ball pretty well um they quarterback you know he might he might show up and he can be an X factor for sure so that's an X factor for them I feel like an X factor for us would be big plays um making plays down the field so they could you know back their defense up a little bit and they have to worry about that and we can turn around and hand the ball off to number nine. Which is on, like I said, he's um, in highs and race himself. So, big plays is, is is a big thing in this game, mm -hmm. and turnovers. Big plays and turnovers is something you definitely want to pay attention to in this game. If it's not the run game. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I was I was just gonna say turnovers and an emotionally charged game like this will be. Both teams will probably capitalize on turnovers if there are any. I think from a Michigan perspective, you know maybe you get Cornelius Johnson going right. If you watch the Wisconsin game, able to take some shots deep to different guys that kind of opened it up and, and really separated them in that game. I think they got to be able to find some long balls or at least some intermediate routes to stretch the Michigan State defense because if it's Michigan State of old, the team that I've always watched, they'll load up the box and come downhill and try to punish you. And if you don't have anything to get behind them with, then then you know, you're know you in trouble possibly. So. You know, the Michigan wide receivers got to get going. Um, I, you know, maybe they got something up their sleeve this week. We'll see. But I, I would agree. I think big plays, big long balls, and, and turnovers will probably be the difference in the game. It's interesting. The, the coaches, you know, Michigan brought Harbaugh back, and I'm sure many alumni, as we know, weren't very happy with his first five years there, but he is back and doing well. Mel Tucker, on the other hand, um, out of the shoot, has been incredible. And now there's talk that he may leave. So... What do you look at the at, at Tucker's um, impact? He made it quickly, and is he that great a coach? You think that he's like at the top of the list nationally? Yeah, Coach Tucker, what he's been able to do in this short amount of time is, is crazy. You know, you look at Michigan State and the the teams that they've had over the last six, five, six years. There's just a huge lack of confidence and lack of swagger. 
like when Tony and I were there, you know, there was an unwavering sense of confidence that every time we went out in the field, um, except Alabama, that we knew that we were going to go win. Like we, it didn't matter who we were playing. We knew that we stepped foot out there on that field. We're going to win this game. And you see that with this team now, the excitement, the confidence, the swagger that they have, you know, all starting with coach Tucker, you know, they, they love the man and you, you see it out there on the field and, you know, hats off to him, what he's been able to do in such a short amount of time. And, you know, we hope, we hope he doesn't leave. We'd love for him to stay and uh, continue, you know, this, this amazing football program that he's been able to rebuild, you know, not that, you know, no slack to coach Antonio that it was rebuilding, but um, the, the Spartans were struggling for quite some time and he's been able to change that. So we're uh, extremely happy. Well, as long as they keep on doubling his salary, it's going to be hard for him to turn it down. Uh, at this point, you know, I want to go over here to Jimmy. Um, your thoughts on the game and also your thoughts on your career. Stand up, buddy. Come on, stand up. Stand up. Um, first, first of all, um, uh, before I have you talk to the players a little bit, what's it like 43? Oh, over here. Okay, good. So your camera guy can catch us, right? Come on. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Jimmy, what do you think? What do you think about, uh, let me get, okay, I'll get on this side, then get a shout out. What do you think about what, some of the comments about this game? How do you see it? And is it as unpredictable as ever? Yeah, and uh, they're all great. I mean, all of them have said exactly what I would say. Big picture for me, and when you look at this football game, there's three parts of it. You can get X's and O's all you want, but it comes down, in my opinion, to turnovers, stop the runner, run the ball, and win the special team. The team that does that, two of the three, I think wins. I mean, that's big picture, but they've all mentioned it, and it's very true. I think that's that – you look at the history of this game, special teams play has always come in and done something. Mm -hmm. um, turnovers have always been huge. And um, the run game, I think Jake mentioned, I think it's like 40 or 43 years now, the team that's rushed for the most yardage has won the game. That looks like it's the same thing this year, and it's on the road, and – Michigan can't make mistakes on the road. If they do, they get that Spartan Stadium crowd involved. Look out. It's a tough place to play. I asked them about their nostalgia, not being with the program anymore. How about your nostalgia? You started in 1968, and we were freshmen together. By the way, Jimmy and I were classmates, freshmen together. Now, let's see, from 68 to now, it's 50-some years. You're going to be saying goodbye. How, what, what are your emotions? Um, it's interesting because I, I, I am grateful. My emotion is gratitude because I've had the opportunity to broadcast 43 straight Michigan-Michigan State games from the broadcast booth, whether it's color or play-by-play. -play. Before that, since I grew up in East Lansing, I've probably attended 60 Michigan-Michigan State games because when my brother Art played there, 59, 60, and 61, I was a 9, 10-year-old kid, and I was running around with my brother wearing the green and white, and I was hanging out with his teammates, and I was enjoying that as a 9, 10-year-old. So I've seen this rivalry in a lot of different directions. I have great gratitude. I, I will miss it, certainly. But more importantly, the overriding emotion I have is gratitude. To have the opportunity to broadcast, be a part of this program, University of Michigan football program, as a player, now as a broadcaster. People ask you, how's your career been? They say, if you have a job you love, you don't work a day in your life, I'm guilty. And Lou Gehrig said it when... He left Yankee Stadium, the lucky guy in the face of the earth. Hey, Luke Gehrig ain't got nothing on me. I'm very, very happy and very comfortable in retiring this year and moving on with life. And believe me, I'm not dying. I'll be back. I'm around. I just uh, won't be in the booth broadcasting Michigan, Michigan State. Anything to say to these guys as they uh, are most of them entering the, the, real, the real world now? No, great representatives of their university and the football program. That, to me, is the most important thing. I, th the truth of the matter is I don't really care. I, I do care how many games they won and lost and all that. But you know what it matters to all of us, and it should matter, is that you're good fathers, that you're good members of the community, and that you, know, you represent your university in a class in a positive way. And I think all of them do that. And for that, I think Michigan and Michigan State should be proud. And I am very proud of that. All right. Guys, where do we go from here? Anybody else have a question from the audience? I've kind of uh, shot most of my bullets. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay. Wait a minute. Oh, there's a hand way in the back. All right. Well, in the meantime, in the meantime, so uh, 
what what are your what are your thoughts about uh, in general the, these programs? Are they on are both on the way up? Are they are they are they solid? And where do you see the the, the future with uh, especially if uh, Tucker stays? Yeah, Mel Tucker's going to LSU, so <laughs> Sparty's done after this one and done here. He's got a question. I'm just kidding, everyone. Ha. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think I think both programs are in a great direction. The unfortunate part is is that Ohio State just refuses to get bad, right? So I think this game, unfortunately, has the feeling it might not mathematically work out to be this way, but it has the feeling that it's whoever wins this has the right to play Ohio State to go play in the Big Ten championship game, right? And and unfortunately for both our institutions, that's been the reality of it the last 20 years. So I, I like where Michigan's program's at right now, of course. Um, Coach Harbaugh seems to be back to his old ways, that offense. The defense is playing well. There seems to be just some really good chemistry up there. I, you know, I, I won't speak for the Spartans, but from a Michigan perspective, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think things are going pretty well right now. And this is a, a – boy, it's a crucial game to, to continue to cement that that path is laid out the right way. Yeah, I agree. I really like the, the, the changes that were made on the coaching staff this year. I think Coach Harbaugh himself is really carrying a new energy. Um, you know, lost a lot of weight this offseason. Um, but that matters, though. You know, it really does is, 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 you know, really committing to it's all areas of your life. You can't be elite in one area and lack in others. And he's committing to, you know, being elite in everything he does. Bringing in a new defensive coordinator, a younger staff. I think that's critical for recruiting because ultimately having good players is what drives, you know, winning. So, um, you know, bringing in that younger staff, helping us secure, you know, and relate to some of the younger kids, um, you know, is, is critical. But what Jack said is this game, you know, you feel good about what Michigan's done this season, but this is the game that really matters. You know, we can't be happy about beating everybody but our rivals. We're, we're judged on whether or not we beat those rivals. And, and, and this week is going to be critical that we go in there and, and really make a statement. Going off of uh, you know Michigan State, Mel Tucker, I think he's done an amazing job. Like I said before, there's just a different energy you see from watching games on the sideline, the players that are making the plays uh, during the games, um, the coaching staff swagger even. I mean, it's just it's a different group of guys. Yeah, it's a different coaching staff, but there's a whole new energy along with it. And you know the amount of plays that they're making on, on offense and defense, how they're winning, the points they're scoring. Um, you know, Tony and I were on a very, really, really powerful offensive team in 2014, and we set records. And I'm like, they have to be shattering those records that, that we were making. So, you know, if Coach Tucker decides to stay, I think obviously sky's the limit for that program. They're going to be an elite program for a long time. I don't think it's just a one-year kind of fluke thing. And uh, yeah, I think he's done an amazing job. Um, yeah, to uh, carry on what he said, I feel like Mel Tucker has done a great job. Like I see like the energy and I see the effort. Like I, I, I enjoy watching what I'm seeing out there. Like I can see wide receivers blocking down the field. I can see corners tackling, coming up and tackling in the backfield. I can just see the effort. The effort is there. The energy is there. And you can't like coach effort. Like you got to coach effort then you need, you need to get a, a whole new group of players. You feel what I'm saying? So it's good to see that. People are taking pride of what they're doing out there on that field. People are taking pride of the Spartan tradition. People are taking pride of you know playing in the woodshed. And um, Mel Tucker has definitely brought that energy back. Like it's like it's probably been gone for like a couple years or something like that. But it's always good to see and just know that even if you do lose or something like that, just not this game. But even if you do lose, <laughs> you can lose like with pride. You can lose like knowing that okay, we just made a, a play here, or make another play here, or the play there. But not like lacking effort, you feel me? And I don't see them lacking effort out there, so I'm excited from what I see. And we'll take one more from the crowd before we kind of wrap this up. Your name? Claudia Fromm. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Thank you all for having such a wonderful luncheon. Um, we've all heard the coaches talk about rivalry and that for years and years, and I'm going to assume that from the Michigan State guys, they'll say that the biggest rivalry is U of M. U of M, guys, is your biggest rivalry the boys from State? Or Ohio State? Your biggest rivalry is who you're playing that week. <laughs> I'm going to run for office one day. That's a, that's a political answer right there. <laughs> it's a truth, though. It's the truth. Um, and they're, they're, they're massive rivalries, but in their own way. Um, we kind of touch on this. This is, this is a brotherhood. You're within the state. You're battling for Michigan. Um, there is hatred. You know you're going to get in a fist fight when it's Michigan, Michigan State. Whereas the Ohio State game, um, you know, traditionally, it, that, that's, you're playing for the Big Ten. You know, you're playing for the, the rights to call yourself the best. So um, they're unique in their own way, but you better not, you better not rate one above the other because you're going to have to bring your A game to either game. 
Well, that should do it for our luncheon today. Let's hear it for Tony, for Connor, for Jake and Jack. Great job, guys. And enjoy the game on Saturday, and maybe we'll see you again next year at Tablegate, and maybe Bill Harrington will invite me back for a 10th straight year, my goodness. And to answer your question, Eli, why did I pick you? Because you do a great job. So let's hear it for Eli. So now, okay, Bobby Keys is coming up here. We have some drawings. I want to, again, thank you guys. Tony, Jake, uh, Connor, and Jack, thanks so much. You were drafted number two today, Jack, but uh, <laughs> fabulous job, fabulous job. So, Bobby, you got the, you got the tickets? Okay, so we're going to start off. We're going to draw for this uh, Michigan drink stand. Okay, so Jack just drew 822207. 822207. Who is Okay, come on up here. Come on up here. <laughs> you don't get that back. You can get the state one. Okay. Well, I actually you should you should get that one. Then you got to trade with somebody else. You know, okay, we, that. that's right. Okay, okay. So now we're going to draw for the Michigan State one. I'll read the number. Yeah. Eight two 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 six one. Eight two 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 six one. Anybody? Last call. Last call. Last call. One, two. Is that someone running up here? No? Okay, we're drawing again. Here we go. Go ahead. All right, we got 822 282 Okay, what's going on over there? 822 Come on now. There we go. Okay. Let's. Okay. So are you a Michigan or Michigan State? Okay. Then. There you go. There you go. Does there money change hands? Is there. Very good. Okay. Okay. We have a couple. Uh, what else we got here? Yeah. Liz and Michelle. Come on up here. In the meantime, while you're coming up here, we have a football. We've got two footballs autographed by the guys. Okay, let's have Jake. Let's have Jake draw one. Bobby. You got the microphone. Eight two 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 eight one. Eight two 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 eight one. Who's got that? Eight two 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 eight one. Okay. Here we go. I'd throw it to you, but oh, here, <laughs> Connor, throw it to him. See if he can catch it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There you go. Okay. Okay, one more football. Go ahead, Connor. Draw this one. We got eight two two. Two five five. Eight two 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 five five. Eight two 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 five five. Here we go. There we go. Jake, throw that. See if you can catch it. <laughs> Whoa, good catch. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Good catch. Okay, what do we got here now? We've got um $200 dinner, $200 dinner at Eddie V's. Who's got, J Jack, draw this one. If I can get it. 822213. 822213. 822. It's mine. I, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, here, here, draw it again, draw it again. I'm not taking it. <laughs> 
I'm not taking it here. Hold on. I'm impressed. Okay. <laughs> hey, that's a good omen. Go blue. Yeah, right. <laughs> 822197. 822197. Who's that top? We're going to Eddie V, sir. <laughs> okay. Then we have, uh, what is this? Dinner for two at the Fogo de Chao, right? Okay. Oh, we got Tony. Come on, draw this one. Uh, we got 822 251. 822 Here we go. That, hey. Who's that back at Norb's table? Okay, we have one more cocktail set from Eddie V's, and it doesn't come with the booze. Maybe if you go there, they'll fill it up, though. Okay, who's drawing this? Jake. Eight two 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 seven four. Eight two 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 seven four. Okay, and for our, for our guest, we have dinner for two here at the Skyline Club. No, that, that, that stays. That stays, for D, that's, that, that stays for the Detroit Sports Media. 50-50, okay. And how much, uh, how much are we giving away? $212. Okay, who wants to draw... Okay, Connor's drawing this one for two hundred and two hundred and twelve bucks. Okay. Four seven zero zero six zero. Oh, it's mine. <laughs> four seven zero zero. What? It's four seven zero zero six zero. Zero six zero. And the <laughs> Robert. Okay. <laughs> cash meet Robert at the bar I love you. okay so thank you everybody thanks again thanks to Tony Lippett Connor Cook Jake Butt and Jack Miller thanks guys appreciate it thanks again we'll see you next time Hi, I'm Chase Hobson reporting at the Skyline Club in Southfield, Michigan. I'm here with Tony Lippett, a former MSU player and former professional football player. Tony, how does the how does the environment and like the practice change during the week of this big rivalry game? It changes a lot, man. It's like when you get out there, there's no laughing. It's so much attention to detail, the passion, you feel it around campus, campus starting to liven up. The energy just be the energy just be so different and so strong that weekend. It lead up to that game, and then when the game come out there, we all just explode and just try to make plays, make as many plays as we can, and win the game. Right, yeah, I mean, really competitive game out there, really brutal. And at these rivalry games, the stands are just completely packed, like completely full. How does this crowd pressure when you're playing away or when you're at home, how does this pressure affect the game? Does it make you more nervous, or how, how does that affect it? Um, the pressure, I mean, the, the fans is, is crazy, especially playing at Michigan. Playing at Michigan, I was one of the loudest stadiums I ever played in, especially like when they win it or when they make a big play, like you literally can't hear nothing in there. And that definitely has a hold on you because you got to hear it. You can't, you can't hear in the huddle. You can't hear really what's going on. You can't hear him saying uh, uh, the cadence or anything like that. So it'd be different. But when you're playing at home, the energy be there. The, the crowd be going crazy. They lie with you. They for you and things like that. So the fans definitely have a toll on this game because there's a lot of passionate fans that come around and come. They definitely come travel all around the world to come and play that game. So. Right, yeah, that must be really cool playing out there with all those fans, especially when you're at home and they're all cheering for you. But uh, last question, we got to ask it. What is your prediction for this Saturday's game of the, the big rivalry? Um, I feel like it's going to be a good game. It's going to be a competitive game, hard-nosed game, a 12 o'clock noon game. I feel like Michigan State is going to win. I'll probably say the score would be, I think it's going to be like 31 to 21, Michigan State. So I feel like we're going to pull it out. 
Well, there you have it. He has a 10-point gap between the two teams. Thank you so much for your time, Tony. We'll send it back to Danny, who's going to do an interview right after this. Thanks, Chase. Alongside me right now is Jake Butt, a former MSG, or excuse me, Michigan Wolverine. And, you know, you talked about a lot of things up there, but one of the things mainly I wanted to ask was just the atmosphere leading up to the game, really important, big for both teams. What is it like as a player just getting into the mindset and attitude before the game and just that week leading up to it? I think that's a great question because in a game like this and, and, and really in college football, is atmosphere is so important. It's what makes it so special. You have the, the bands in the stadium. You have, you know, you have people that are coming back to their alma mater, strong ties to the schools. And, of course, here it's Michigan, Michigan State. You're, you're playing for the state of Michigan. You're playing for bragging rights. So the atmosphere is going to be critical, and especially for me being a Michigan guy, the ability to go on the roll, road and control the atmosphere is can we settle the crowd down? Can we sustain drives and kind of take the, take the life out of the crowd? That's going to be critical, critical for us if we want to go in there and win the game. I mean, I couldn't agree more there, but you talk about the atmosphere from the crowd. How is that playing impact for a player down on the field? How much of an impact does the crowd just make for you? Well, you know, you have the, 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 the practicality of it is when you're on offense and the crowd's loud, it's tougher to get communication. It's tougher, you know, to hear your quarterback. It's tougher to hear the play calls in the huddle. So everything, you really have to be dialed in to make sure you're, you're getting everybody's on the same page. But then there's an atmosphere. Football's a game of momentum. Um, you know, you have statistics in, in baseball and basketball, but football is extremely momentum driven. So an atmosphere is going to drive momentum. When a big play happens, the crowd's going to get involved. It's going to give you that extra juice if you're on the right side of it, and maybe you're going to really have to respond if you're on the wrong side of it. So atmosphere absolutely matters. I mean, couldn't have said it better. You speaking from experience as a player, but I have to ask, these rivalries that at games, especially Michigan, Michigan State, how do you think it really shapes you, not only as a player, but just as your life moving forward? Uh, I mean, it, the result doesn't matter. And there was a point in time in my life where the result did matter, but uh, it's about who you become during the profit process that really matters, you know? So you are nervous leading up to the game. You, you, you aren't, you aren't going to get a great night of sleep. You know, you're anticipating a big moment. You're out on the big stage where everybody's watching. It's about who you become as part of the process, and it's less about the result, you know? So, so can I be the guy that performs under pressure? Can I be the guy that can get punched in the mouth and respond? You know, can I win with grace, and can I lose and allow it to shape me and, and improve me down the line? So I think it's less about the result and more about the process. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with me. I really appreciate it. And we'll be back with some more with Chase doing another interview right after this. Thanks, Danny. I'm here with Connor Cook, the former QB for the MSU Spartans. And Connor, what what is one memorable play, one memorable moment, one great pass? What is one key play that you had during one of your rivalry games that just really stands out to you? Well, obviously the Jalen Watts Jackson play. But if I were to say a pass, the back shoulder I threw uh, Tony in the 2014 game at home, where Delano Hill had no idea where the ball was. He turned around. Tony caught it and just was off to the races for uh, I think that was the only touchdown pass I threw that game. But that uh, that was probably like the best pass I threw all season. So oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely an exciting moment there. And so at these rivalry games, you know, the, the stands are always packed with MSU fans or Michigan fans. So at these away games when you play at Michigan, how does this crowd affect your playing abilities? Does it make you more nervous? And how does it affect your throwing or just the things that you do as a quarterback? I think the number one thing that just you know, affects not only me, but the whole team is just communication on offense. You know, it's one thing when you're operating and I could yell something out to a teammate of mine and they can hear me. You don't have to go on silent count, but it's a whole nother animal when you're stepping inside the huddle and you're screaming on the top of your lungs what the play is. And then a player, you break the huddle and a player doesn't know what the play is. And you're going up to the line and you just got to get all 11 guys on the same page. So crowd noise is huge for uh, the opposing offense. Um, but really, I mean, once you have the ball in your hands and you're playing, you don't even hear it. It's really just in the huddle, line of scrimmage. Right, yeah, you zone that out. It gets a little hard to hear what the right. call is there. But last question, we got to know, what is your prediction for the, for the game on Saturday? What do you think the score will be? Uh, Spartans on top, I'm going to say 35-17. 35-17, big gap between the two teams. Thank you so much for doing the interview, and we'll get another.
for interview from Danny later. The leading week leading up to the game, big for a lot of fans. So, you know, what's the man mindset and attitude for a player of you know, coming into that week? Well, I think, you know, I think a lot of times you would say that you treat any week the same, but the reality is in a rivalry week, everything gets ratcheted up a little bit, right? Practice is a bit more intense. The film study is a bit longer, just a little more attention to detail on things. You know how much the game means to the school, means to the fans, means to you as a player. So you try to go the extra mile to make it happen on Saturday. And we mentioned, you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but the actual game itself, being away or home, that crowd can make a big difference. Yeah. So, like for you being at Michigan State, how what is the crowd like there, and what is it like as a player down on the field? Yeah, it's it's hostile. Um, it's a really hostile environment. Obviously, like we talked about today, there's no love loss between the two schools. I think the fans are even more so that way, right? So. You know, I think it, that's what I was talking about earlier. I think it's important for Michigan to try to get out to an early start because if Michigan State does and the fans really get into it, it's going to make it really tough for the Wolverines. Thanks. And just one last question before we let you go. Uh, this rivalry game, obviously really big. What kind do you feel like it's shaped you as not only a player but as a person moving forward in your life? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that football does that in general. But games like this, it's like anything in life, right? There's certain times where – you know, you got to show up, right, where where it's a little more important, uh, some days more important than the other. This game's one of them. I, I think you can carry on those lessons into your life when football's over. I mean, that's just such a great answer. I'd like to thank you for taking the time no, to doing this interview with me. And uh, we'll be more to close out this real quick. But until then, we'll take a short break. That's going to do it for here, us at the Skyline Club for the Michigan-Michigan State table gate. I've been Daniel Sacker, alongside me has been Chase Hobson. We'd like to thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time.